Um, all right, uh, welcome back everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, uh, this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, and this is gonna be part 10 of our look at the Sri Maladevi Simhanada Sutra. Um, if it's your first time here, which I know for someone it is, and also these are being recorded, so you might have just fallen into this. Um, we're pretty deep, we're pretty far along in the sutra, but the way that I always want to do the this Dharma Doors class is we are studying the sutra, and so we're pretty deep into it, but each Sunday night sort of has a, a theme or a focus or one idea that we're talking about. So I try to make these sort of standalone classes in that way. Um, but of course, if you've been reading along or if you've, you've been watching these, um, you'll get more out of it. So that's that idea. Um, so um, on that note, um, tonight, this is our topic. This is the, the big idea, the Dharma body, the Dharmakaya. This is an idea that the star of this sutra, the queen, Srimala, this is an idea that she's been mentioning. She's been mentioning it a lot throughout the sutra, but she hasn't really fully delivered a definition of this yet. It's, it's an idea that she's been teasing out there for a while. And I think tonight we're going to get a better understanding of it. Um, even though last time, last Sunday, I actually read all the way pretty far into chapter 12. Um, there's 15 chapters in this sutra, by the way. Uh, some are very short, just a paragraph. Some are a little bit longer. Um, we cruised right through. I think we started at chapter five or six last time and just cruised right through a number of them. And because we did that, we need to take a step back. So I'm going, to, I'm going to begin tonight. Oh, and by the way, too, if you're not familiar, of course, this is a, uh, this sutra, it's this beautiful little Mahayana Buddhist sutra. There's three, I think three English translations. Uh, one is from Sanskrit and a little bit of Tibetan. And then there's two from the Chinese, uh, one from a fifth century Chinese edition, and then one from a ninth century Chinese edition. I've been bouncing back and forth between those three, as well as a little bit of my own translation I'm working on. The language of this sutra is really tricky. And so depending on the different translators, sometimes I prefer one, sometimes I prefer another. I've been kind of sticking with this version, which is uh, from, again, it's from that ninth century Chinese version, um, which is kind of considered sort of one of the more complete uh, versions of this, by the way. And so it's a nice one to go by. And so in this version, we're going to go back and we need to take a peek at where do we need to take a peek chapter nine so these chapters each of these chapters do have um kind of titles in that way and the title of chapter nine which i haven't always been telling you the title of these because sometimes we're moving so fast i, I don't have time um, the title of this chapter is about the the underlying meaning of emptiness. So that's the that's what the subject of chapter nine is about. And again, we already read chapter nine, but it's a small one. And I'm going to read, I think I'm going to read it pretty much in its entirety. Yeah, so I'm going to read it really quickly just to remind us of a few ideas. And to state sort of a very uh, important theme for tonight. So chapter nine picks up, right? You know, uh, Queen Srimala is rolling right along when she says, and you know, she's speaking, she's sort of delivering this discourse to the Buddha. And so she says, world honored one, this Tathagata Garbha, 
This was the theme of last week. So we spent all last week talking about the, the womb of Buddhahood, the womb of the Tathagatas, the Tathagata Garbha. That's another key idea. Again, we talked about it all last Sunday, but that's going to get clarified tonight too. The, the womb of Buddhas. Where, where do Buddhas come from? Where do Buddhas arise from? Well, but from the womb of Tathagata. And so in describing this idea of the womb of Buddhahood, the womb of the Tathagatas, she says, world honored one, the Tathagata Garbha is the Tathagata's knowledge of emptiness. There you go. That's the definition of the Tathagata Garbha. The womb of Buddhahood is this knowledge or understanding of emptiness, shunyata. She goes on to say the Tathagata Garbha has never been seen or realized by any Shravaka or Pratekya Buddha. It is perceived and witnessed only by Buddhas. And we know, of course, Sri Mala has been talking a lot about sort of different paths of Buddhism, the Shravaka path, the Pratekya Buddha path, or the solitary enlightened path, and in a way, the Buddha path or the Bodhisattva path, the Mahayana. So she's been talking about these kind of three paths, also known as vehicles. And in particular, she's been talking about the kind of shortcomings of the early, early monastic Buddhist path, the Shravaka path, what would be kind of equivalent to the Theravada Buddha, Buddhist tradition of today, the very kind of austere monastic form. That's the Shravaka. Then there's the Pratekya Buddha, the solitary enlightened being out on their own, away from society, away from everyone, completely removed, enlightened, but alone. So there's those two paths. And what she's saying is that this subtle idea of the womb of Buddhahood, the womb of thus come ones, the Tathagatas, this is an idea, this is a concept that the Shravakas and the Pratekya Buddhas cannot, they can't see it. They can't realize it. They, have, they, they, they don't understand it, right? And she says, world honored one, the knowledge of emptiness of the Tathagata Garbha is of two kinds. There's two ways of looking at this knowledge of emptiness. What are the two? The first is the knowledge that the Tathagata Garbha is empty. <laughs> it, it, just, like all phenomena, like all dharmas, it's empty. That is, it's completely removed and apart from all kleshas, all defilements, all afflictions. And it is apart from knowledge which does not lead to liberation. So totally removed from all of that. The second type of knowledge of emptiness of this, the second is the knowledge that the Tathagata Garbha is not empty. That it is, <laughs> that it's, sorry, that it's not empty, that it contains inconceivable dharmas more numerous than the sands of the Ganges River, which embody the Buddha's wisdom of liberation. So those are these sort of two ways of understanding this Tathagata Garbha. And we talked a lot about that last time, so I'm not really interested in that. I'm interested in this next part. World Honored One, advanced Shravakas, advanced voice hearers can, through faith, gain access to these two knowledges of emptiness. World Honored One, the knowledge of emptiness possessed by regular old Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas is connected with and revolves around the four wrong views. 
Therefore, no Shravaka or Pratekya Buddha has ever perceived or realized the complete cessation of suffering. Only the Buddha has realized it directly, has eradicated all defilements and followed in its entirety the path leading to the cessation of suffering. Boom. That's the end of chapter nine. Those are all the various elements that are at play, which in reading this, I realize it's a, it's a lot. We have this Tathagata Garbha. We have this whole Shravaka Pratekya Buddha versus the Buddha divide. We have this emptiness concept that's it's all hinging on this emptiness concept. And then we were just introduced to these four ideas, the four wrong views. And where I left off the last time is sort of having to deal with these. And it's why I needed to take this step back to chapter nine to just remind you of where these came from. These four wrong views, this is how and why these Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas, this is why they don't fully understand the Four Noble Truths. It's why they don't get or fully understand these two kinds of emptiness. So in other words, Srimala is kind of wrapping up her argument in a way by kind of pointing out about how it is that the shortcomings of the Shravaka path and the Pratekya Buddha path has to do with the fact that the, those Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas are still wrapped up in this problem. Okay, we're going to get to that in a second. I wanna, and I want to talk about these at length. They're very important. There was one other thing, though, that got introduced there, and it's another part of Srimala's um, discourse. And it has to do with, of course, the four noble truths. I'm not going to reread all of chapter 10 and 11. They were short, but I don't want to read them. I just want to remind you of what was said there. Srimala does this very interesting thing in this sutra. And it's what I had on the board last time. She's talking about the four noble truths. But she's saying that the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas, that they don't really fully understand all four noble truths, that they have an incomplete understanding of the four noble truths. And ultimately what Srimala does is she starts to isolate and focus on the third noble truth. The third noble truth is the cessation of suffering otherwise known as nirodha. It's basically nirvana. It's the ending of dukkha, the ending of suffering. That's the always the goal of Buddhism. All this other stuff about enlightenment and awakening and anuttara, samyak, sambodhi. Srimala is keeping it real. This is about dukkha. This is about the ending of suffering. And that noble truth, the third one, she kind of holds it out as this un, what she calls an unconditioned dharma. And indeed, that's the very idea of nirodha or the cessation of suffering. Unconditioned versus everything else that is conditional and therefore impermanent and therefore relative and all of these ideas. So it's because of all of these shortcomings that we're about to talk about that the Shravakas and Prateki Buddhas don't fully understand the cessation of suffering, right? So that's part of her argument. I wanted to remind you of all those different elements because once again, all these different threads are about to get um, kind of tied all together. So the last part that we read last week, the really last thing that she got into was about how ordinary people she wasn't so much talking about Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas so much, but she's sort of talking about regular, ordinary, deluded or ignorant people. And she's starting to talk about views. In particular, 
these sort of two extreme views. This is a theme that you see a lot, you hear a lot in Buddhism, these two extreme views, nihilism and eternalism. And these are extreme views, meaning they're at either end of the spectrum. And she kind of basically breaks them down, the eternalist view versus the nihilist view. The, the nihilistic view is the one of what we might call um, scientific materialism. It's just matter. It's just earth. It's just a dancing electron, bio, electro, chemical party here. And as soon as the party ends, meaning when we die, the party's over. Nihilism. It, and it, it, it's all kind of an accident, too, by the way. It all arose sort of accidentally. It, life has no meaning. Do whatever you want. It doesn't really matter because as soon as you die, it's over, period. That's kind of nihilism. I'm summarizing it and kind of giving it a slightly modern twist. But that's the basic idea. And then the other extreme is eternalism. Oh, no, 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 no. We are not this frail body. We are an eternal spirit that will abide in the mind of God or something forever and ever and ever for eternity. That's the eternalist view. And this, again, is in Buddhism, the two extreme views. This one of like, it's all meaningless and going to nothing quickly, or it's all very meaningful and eternal forever. And Buddhism is, of course, the middle path between those extremes, but it's also, Buddhism has its, its own interesting understanding of views. And I say that very carefully. I don't say Buddhism has an interesting view or its own view not nihilistic or eternalistic, but Buddhism has its own view. I didn't say that. I said Buddhism has an interesting ideas about views. So hold on to that idea because we're about to talk about views in depth. Again, everything I've said so far is sort of review, re reminder of what has come. But what my main point of that was, was to remind us of when Sri Mala first introduced the idea of these four wrong views. She does this. It's, it's a beautiful way that sutras happen where, and she's been doing this throughout the sutra. If you might've noticed, I've pointed it out a few times. She'll mention an idea like the four wrong views, but she doesn't define it. She sort of just puts it out there and then carries on with whatever discourse she was on or whatever idea she was talking about. And then she comes back to these ideas. And it's a very interesting way that sutras sort of educate you or teach in that way, where they sort of drop these little breadcrumbs. And then if you've been paying attention to the bread, breadcrumb trail, there's a little payoff at the end. Well, this is the payoff at the end. So, after introducing the two extreme views, she says, and this is now new territory for us tonight. I didn't get this far last week. She says, and by the if you're following along, I am still now kind of right in the middle of chapter 12. World Honored One. Concerning the five aggregates, the skandhas. Deluded sentient beings consider the impermanent to be permanent, suffering to be joy, non-self to be self, and the impure to be pure. The Shravakas and Pratekya Bhuttas, with all their pure wisdom, never glimpse the Buddha's Dharma Kaya, the Buddha's Dharma body, or the state of a Tathagata, a thus come one. Okay, so I need to pause there. I want to talk about these four. They're pretty, very important. And in particular, I think 
These four are really, really important for understanding this idea of the Dharmakaya. It's kind of, and she's going to say this in her own way, but I'm going to do say it my way kind of in the beginning, just to kind of make things a little clearer and then we'll hear how she says it. But I just kind of want to let you know that as I about, I'm about to kind of break these down a little more clearly than the text gives us. And I want us to be thinking about how the Dharma body, the Dharmakaya of the Buddha is, is in, it's in this in a way. Uh, let me, let me sh explain what I mean. So you might be already familiar with these, um, you know, there's all these various lists, of course, in Buddhism, these matraka, these lists of dharmas. And sometimes these lists of dharmas shift a little bit. Sometimes they have three, sometimes they have four, sometimes they even have five. And you might be familiar with three of these because you often hear about in Buddhism, and it's kind of more of a Theravada or Shravaka idea, an early Buddhist idea. And it's an idea that's called the, the three marks of existence. It's usually the way it's translated. These are the three lakshana, the three characteristics, the three qualities of existence. It's an early Buddhist teaching. And it's kind of this interesting way of looking at reality. In fact, that's exactly what we're talking about. Ways of looking at reality. We call those ways of looking at reality. We call those, or at least Buddhists call them, a drishti, a view. And this word drishti does mean a gaze, to gaze or to look at. But the way it's used in, in Buddhism is the same exact way that in English, we would say a, a point of view. When we say a point of view, we don't mean viewing with your eyes. A point of view is the way you view with your whole, with your whole being, right? Because it's your, a point of view is like your opinion, your, your heartfelt feeling about this, this stuff. So it's not just the way you see with your eyes, it's the way you interpret and process information. That's a view, that's a drishti. And the, this idea of a drishti or a view and viewing or gazing at this world, and it, you might view or gaze this world and you may put things into different categories or boxes, beautiful, ugly, useful, useless, beneficial, harmful, good, bad, uh, even more less abstract, close by, far away, up, down, high, and low. I mean, it goes on and on and on and on and on. Now, within that realm of putting things in all these boxes, what we're doing, of course, is using different things, characteristics, their qualities, what Buddhists call lakshana. And the idea is, is that to say that this is beautiful and this is ugly is a way of looking at their characteristics or their qualities. The interesting view from a Buddhist point of view is this early Buddhist idea of the, the, a way of viewing reality, which is that even though it appears like all of this stuff has these different characteristics or qualities like beautifulness or ugliness or whatever, whatever, whatever. The early Buddhist teaching was that you can actually kind of see all phenomena, all dharmas, all things, no matter how big, no matter how small, no matter how tangible or mentally ephemeral, you can see all things equally in a sense, as having all of them having the same three characteristics, the characteristic of being impermanent, that no matter what it is, it's not gonna last. It's not gonna stay just like that, right? 
And so the idea is, is that any dharma, any concept or idea or object or thing that you can imagine, one of its characteristics is that it's impermanent. Another characteristic the Buddha said that all phenomena share is that all phenomena can be viewed as ultimately as a source of suffering. Even the things that we think are giving us pleasure are at the end of the day, ultimately going to be creating a sense of displeasure, in particular when we are without them. Because the same thing that gives me pleasure when I have it can now be a source of displeasure when I am without it, right? So it's interesting that the same thing that causes me joy can right away cause me not joy when I am not allowed to have it. So that's the teaching about viewing all things, even though it might seem like some, some things are pleasurable and some things are not. What the Buddha taught in an early tradition to view all things as a source of suffering. And the third shared characteristic of all phenomena is that even though it might seem as if there's a you there experiencing this impermanent suffering object, that there's a self involved in this experience, there's no self involved in this experience. It's, this one's tricky, but that's a quick summary. We're going to go a little deeper in this idea, so don't worry. So those are these original three marks of existence. And what the Buddha would then talk about regarding those three marks of existence is that what has deluded ignorant people turned about, what has us trapped in samsara, what has us habitually conditioned into a deluded state is that we mistake the, imperm the impermanent for being permanent. We mistake suffering for pleasure. We mistake that which has no self as if it had a self. And then Srimala in this sutra adds a fourth one here, that we mistake the impure for being pure. So those are the four wrong views according to Sri Mala. And these are the four wrong views that have the Shravakas and have the Pratekya Bhuttas still turning about, still um, actually still suffering from underlying ignorance. That's another idea she introduced early on is that the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas still have underlying ignorance. And now we're starting to get an understanding of where this underlying ignorance comes from, it comes from these four wrong views. So bef again, before I go on to her, to Sri Mala's really interesting point here, the really interesting thing that she has to say, let's break these down a little bit further. So let's, let, and let's just do them in order. So the basic idea, the first one is this idea of mistaking that which is impermanent for permanent. I like this one because it's kind of actually the, it's the easiest one to start with as an example. <clears throat> the idea is we kind of know almost intuitively in a certain sense, that all things are sort of in a state of change, if you will. Call it decay, state of change. But things don't stay exactly the same. They change. They decay, they get old, they break, they fall apart. And the idea here is, is that what's nice about being in the 21st century, even you know, back in the 20th century, is that it was almost as if the entire world through empirical science had come to an embracing of these physical laws. And again, pretty much around the world, there's these physical laws in particular, like laws of thermodynamics, for example. 
And one of these laws of thermodynamics is about state changes. It's always in a state of change in a way. It's not going to stay exactly the same. It's like entropy in that sense. So the idea is, is that our science says everything's impermanent. Our gut tells us everything is impermanent. Logic, reason, intuition, everything tells us that things are constantly changing and are not staying the same. The problem is, though, is that we behave sometimes as if we hope that's not true. Like, not this time. This time, it's going to stay just like this. Oh, darn, it didn't stay just like that. Here I am in a state of suffering because I was, I was really hoping that this would stay exactly like it was. <laughs> The thing about that is, is that again, we knew better. We know better. We know things are gonna break. We know things are falling apart. It, again, it's a fundamental aspect of the way we see the world and fundamental aspect of reality. So the idea of ignorance and ignorant at this, in this scenario, ignorance is a great word. We are ignoring, we're ignoring these fundamental laws that we know to be true when we try to hold on to something. And, and to stay just that way, you know, we, maybe we do it with our looks where it's like, no, stop getting older. I'm trying to be 21 forever. Like, like, hold on. And then there it goes again, getting grayer, getting wrinklier, getting changing. And if we weren't so deluded in thinking that we could hold on to it, we wouldn't suffer from it. But that's the disjuncture. That's that's what the uh, that's what we are out of alignment with is that idea and again it goes on and on and on and on and on right there's just, i mean it goes on and on <laughs> in terms of impermanence and the small little ways in which we hope to circumvent this fundamental law <laughs> right any questions about mistaking the impermanent for permanent. Pretty straightforward, right? Okay, so now we go on to, and which one do I, oh, right, suffering. So this one is a, a really uh, also classic, classic human behavior. Mistaking the, mistaking suffering for pleasure. Um, not, um, I haven't said this one in a while, right? But there's this beautiful terminology in, in Buddhism. Um, this word suffering, this idea of suffering, it's this idea of dukkha, right? And dukkha is this, well, you know, we translate it as suffering, but it has a lot of subtle connotations. Um, I referenced one just a moment ago that it can mean out of joint, disjointed. You can imagine as if your shoulder were to pop out of socket. Yeah, it would be suffering. That's for sure. Like physical pain suffering. But what's really the problem is that your shoulder isn't where it should be. It's out of alignment. And that being out of alignment is causing like dukkha. It's helpful to know that a connotation or one of the one of the meanings of dukkha is this idea of being out of joint. But we're like just out of joint in, for example, mistaking the impermanent for being permanent. Or number two, mistaking suffering for pleasure. Again, there's so many examples of this, um, you know, how many to choose from. Um, I'm, I'm always really much more ready to talk about my own experience. I know we all go through suffering. We, and I have deep respect for all of our suffering, but I only know my own in that way. And so one way that I know that I've suffered from this problem is, in my, especially more in my youth, hasn't really been a issue or a problem in that way for decades, but definitely when I was younger, I would definitely mistake uh, a night of drinking, <laughs> a night of poisoning myself as a good time. 
I remember that. I remember making myself very, very ill and mistaking it for a good time. <laughs> Maybe you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Maybe, I don't know. But, you know, it happens, you know, again, with alcohol. It, ha it can happen with food. It's another one, too, just to be confessional here. I... Uh, I mentioned, I confessed or confessed, I mentioned this to someone uh, recently, you know, I would have this sort of problem where I would get the kind of the munchies, but just in the middle of the night, I would wake up hungry and I would eat sweets. They were easy. They were, they tasted good. It was pleasurable. And so I would kind of wake up in the middle of the night, have a little snack, go back to sleep, but I would wake up not fe have with bad <laughs> digestion. It was not pleasurable. It was not pleasurable, but for some reason I kept doing it. I kept mistaking suffering for pleasure. Again, I could, I could, I personally, I could just be here all night just telling you all the various ways in my life that I've mistaken <laughs> the suffering for pleasure in that way. So that's, that's that. Again, pretty straightforward, right? Okay. I think you get the idea. And by the way, we're going to do a kind of a, a summary of all these two. So we're, we're not done yet. But now let's talk about this one, the, the, the really kind of heavy one, which is a, this idea of mistaking the non-self, mistaking there not being a self for self. This is the, definitely the one that's kind of the trickiest. Um, it's always the trickiest with Buddhism because it's this fundamental idea of anatta or anatman, no self. It's, it's like paradoxical. Like, it's like, but what, I'm right here. Like, what are you talking about? So we need to kind of peel back the layers of this idea of no self to then start to arrive at what it would mean to <clears throat> mistake not self for a self. And I've been trying to think of like a good example of this. This one's a little trickier. Definitely not, not something that's foreign to me. That's for sure. But I've been trying to think of an example for my life. Um, and I think I found one. And it's not perfect, but I think it's one of those ones that hopefully you'll understand what I mean by it. So also when I was younger, not, not really lately at all, also at all, like in the last many decade or two, but also when I was younger, a certain type of anxiety and even maybe paranoia, just every now and then nothing severe, and I know other people, I've talked with other people, of course, this is not unique to have this experience. Um, I know for, for some that I've shared with and talked with, this, of course, another one you, you may be familiar with, but this sense of uh, paranoia or anxiety can be also exacerbated, say, by certain uh, chemicals or certain substances, let's say, right? Certain drugs can make you paranoid, right? So it's a good example to play with. And what I mean is, is this, maybe this has happened to you in a small degree or a great degree, or maybe you just know what I'm talking about, but it's never happened to you. Regardless, think about it this way. Think about somebody, hypothetical scenario now, who, you know, um, smokes a bunch of cannabis or something else that would make you somebody very paranoid or has a tendency to do that, right? You could imagine that person freaking out, right? But what are some particular qualities of this freak out, right? Think about the idea of the, um, the, the person who's kind of in that freak out mode and then they hear like a police uh, siren. And it, the immediate thought is, oh, oh, they're coming to get me. Or then they hear a helicopter. And it's like, oh my God, they got, the, they got the helicopter. They're coming to get us. And you could imagine a kind of paranoia that's spinning out of control. 
And in that paranoia, every sound, every commotion, every activity is about you, is being filtered through the lens of self. The helicopter's off doing whatever it's doing. It has nothing to do with you, but you can make it about you, especially when we're in one of those uh, heightened paranoia, anxious states, right? So think about that, again, either from an example of your own life or just that I know you know this happens to people, that they can get really anxious and really start to think that everything's about them in that way to the point where, again, everything is being interpreted through the lens of self when it's not really the case. It's not really the case that any of this other, pardon my disappearance, um, it's not the case that I, this other phenomena has anything to do with you, but you can make it about you in that way, right? Everybody with me on that? So what if you kind of think about it that way and then kind of ease up, we're no longer in a drug-induced <laughs> freak out, right? But what I wanna get at is how it might be that any experience of self is cramming experience through the lens of self in a very similar way to that paranoid freak out. And that you could actually have an experience right now, right here, that has nothing to do with self. And what I'm thinking of, what I'm imagining right now, is that kind of, you know, what we would call a flow state or that kind, even a trance state of that sort where, or, or even better actually than a flow state or a trance state is a state in which you are really immersed in a project, something creative, something you love to do, and you've really just lo lost yourself in it. And what I mean is, is that in that moment where you're doing the thing that you're doing, but you're just not thinking about the self, worrying about the self, cramming everything through the lens of self, but you're really just kind of being. And then something might, of course, trigger you to start to squeeze in. They call it a contraction of the mind in Buddhism. Your mind could contract around the self, the idea of self, and all of a sudden it could now, now no longer be so flowy, if, if you know what I mean. But it's, it's more anxious. It feels more between the ears, behind the eyes, more trapped. Whereas a moment ago, I was doing my art and I felt as if I was the art. I felt as if I was everywhere and nowhere. In fact, I wasn't even thinking about myself. It was just happening. That's what we're talking about is that this very self that we are so convinced of we have experiences where it ebbs and flows. Its presence ebbs and flows and it can get really constricting or at times really not so constricting. And at the end of the day, at the end of this Dharma talk, what the Buddha came to say, one of the things the Buddha came to say is that actually there just is no self and it, all it is is a constriction of the mind. Your, any sense of self is just a constriction of mind. Let me, again, let me try to be careful with my language, right? Not a constriction of your mind, a constriction of mind that then produces a sense of self and so on. Michael. In other words, the Dharma, the teaching here is anatta, anatman. There's no self. I've just tried to give you a sense of how it might be that a, a sense of self arises and why it might feel the way it feels now. But the teaching here then is we are deluded and ignorant for mistaking no self for self, especially when we're in a drug-induced paranoid freak out, right? <laughs> 
Yeah, I, Michael, what comes to mind are two things is, and that sometimes um, I have problems with um, psychotherapy in general, like people going to psychotherapy and I know it has its place, but I, sometimes I feel like people in my environment who has been going to psychotherapy for years and years, Wow, like because in psychotherapy you're and when it's not based on you know Buddhist teachings, oftentimes the eye gets um, in the center of attention and it's only about the eye. And so, um, yeah, I found it a little difficult. That's one thing that came to mind. I, I agree. Um, my, yeah, I I think you know obviously not all psychotherapists are the same in that way. Some wiser than others. But I hear what you're saying, Connie, for sure. And it, that's, yep, it's good insight. All right, everybody, everybody okay with the first three wrong views? So now let's just talk about her fourth, uh, the wrong view. The fourth thing that has the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas deluded and ignorant. <laughs> no, no offense to any. <laughs> I'm sure you're one of the wise, you're the wise one I was talking about. The, that employs great Buddhist upaya, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, the fourth one is mistaking impure for pure. And, you know, this is one, a delicate one. I need to unpack this very, very carefully. Any language of purity and impurity within the context of religion is like dangerous territory, right? We, we know this. So I want to be really clear about how Buddhists use this language. It's definitely a, a kind of um, a culture, a cultural problem almost because of what the words pure and impure mean, say in a um, more or less kind of Christian or Judeo-Christian kind of culture and society, purity and impurity have certain contexts. And there's a there is a, a go-to metaphor, a go-to metaphor for purity and impurity that Buddhism uses a lot. And it speaks to the Buddhist culture that's different than our modern English-speaking Judeo-Christian culture in that way. And what I mean is, is this, there, the metaphor of purity and impurity, a very good metaphor, and the Buddhists use it, is one of, um, I guess, what, how, what would you call it? It's a uh, metallurgical, it would be a metallurgical metaphor regarding gold, gold and alloys. In other words, you know, usually when you get some gold, it's alloyed, has all these other things in it, right? So it's not all gold it probably have some iron in there might have some pyrite in there it might have a bunch of other minerals and other things in it and so of course what you do is you fire it you put it in a cauldron and you burn burn away the impurities you burn away the other things and of course you start to get your various grades of gold your 18 carats and your 24 carats and and those carats those uh grades of gold depend on how much how much is it gold and how much is it other stuff is there silver in there is it cut with silver like so when we're talking about purity we would be we're all we're talking about is the idea of pure gold like meaning nothing but gold nothing but gold not there's nothing else in there it's pure it's pure gold we would in english we would use language that way of course and we would describe it like if i if i gave it to you and i gave you a you know i went to the national In institute of standards and technology i went to nist and I got them stamp of approval. There is nothing in this block but the element gold. It's pure gold. That's pure. And if it's mixed with other stuff, that's impure. 
So that's how Buddhists use language of purity and impurity. They're talking about it being totally 100% versus mixed up. So this is not, although it becomes, and this is where it gets so tricky because language is tricky. It, even in Buddhism, it becomes associated with moral purity. But the problem is, is that in the Judeo-Christian, pure, impure is strictly about morality. And you don't, and at least the way that I understand English language and the way these words are used, if in a religious context, if somebody were talking about pure and impure, I would be, I would be thinking sin, be thinking all these other things. And the first thing that comes to my mind would not be about 100% of something versus 80%, 20%. I say all of this because this is a very, very long-winded way of introducing you to a way that Buddhists use language, and they use the language of purity and impurity to talk about unconditioned and conditioned, asamskrita and samskrita. These are ideas that Srimala introduced, I think, last time. But this is kind of a thing, of course, in Buddhism, the idea of conditioned phenomena, conditioned dharmas, and the unconditioned, asamskrita. The idea is, is that a conditioned dharma, something that's conditional, well, it's relative. It's relative to something else. And therefore, it's conditional. And if this is relative to that, then these are kind of in a relationship with one another. And this isn't pure because it, it relies upon this other thing. It depends upon it. And of course, in particular, there's this idea of the kind of um, shifting nature of the conditional because it's relative, because it's conditional, all things are kind of shifty that way. It's another thing that makes them impure is they're relative, they're conditional, they're impermanent, they're so, all these things are kind of what makes them impure. And so purity in Buddhism is the unconditioned, that which is not relative, that which is not conditional. And for the most part, of course, the unconditioned is pretty inconceivable because the way that we think is using conditions where that's how we think in that way. So in other words, to mistake the impure for pure is mistaking the conditioned for the unconditioned mistaking the relative for that which is absolute or not relative. That's what this fourth one is kind of talking about in that way. There's other, of course, other, refer other connotations to purity and impurity that probably apply, but there's this really deep underlying meaning of conditional or unconditional. Everybody doing okay with those four wrong views. Okay, so this is where it's gonna get really interesting. We have just, we're right where we need to be. So, Bye. oh yeah, we don't need to talk about it. Let's just do it, let's just do it. So, Sri Mali continues, after stating that the Shravakas and Pratekya Buddhas because of, because of all of this, because of everything we just talked about, they are, they never glimpse, is the language, they never glimpse the Buddha's dharmakaya, the dharma body of the Buddha, nor do they get a glimpse of the state of a thus come one, the state of a Tathagata. She goes on to say, if, a sentient being out of faith 
in the Tathagata regards the Tathagata as permanent, joyful, pure, and possessing a self, one does not see the Tathagata wrongly. One sees correctly. How so? Because the Dharmakaya, the Dharma body of the Tathagata, is the permanence paramita, the perfection of permanence. The body, the Dharmakaya of the Tathagata, is the joy paramita, the perfection of joy. The Dharmakaya of the Tathagata is the self paramita, the perfection of self, and the Dharmakaya, the Dharma body of the Buddha, or Tathagata, is the purity paramita, the perfection of purity. Those sentient beings who assume such a view are said to have the right view, the samyak drishti. Those who assume the right view are called the true children of the Buddha, born from the mouth of the Buddha, born from the true Dharma, born from the born from miraculous transformation of the Dharma. And they are heirs to the Buddha Dharma. Okay, we're going to pause there. So, I mean, maybe, you know, maybe it didn't shock you, but it shocked me when I first read this to hear Sri Mala say that these four, that the, or that the Dharma body of the Tathagata, she introduces these four new paramitas. You know about the paramitas, right? Generosity, moral discipline, patience, determination, meditation and wisdom will add four more to the list of paramitas the paramita of permanence the paramita of joy the paramita of self and the paramita of purity srimala is next level she's next level she's talking about these par it's it's really amazing so She's turned these four, these four, meaning the opposites. So the, the self, the pure, the permanent, all that. She says that the Dharmakaya of the Tathagata is the perfection of these four things, self, purity, permanence, and suffering, right? Yeah, I think... Let me, any questions about that right away? Like, does that bring you anything up? Like, yeah, Tanya. Yeah, I mean, the one that sticks out for me, the weirdest is the perfection of self, right? Like I could see the perfection of like permanence. If, if you're like completely in, uncon if you're completely in the unconditioned, maybe, you know, you, you could be there permanently like in Nirvana, right? Um, and it's sort of a kind of purity, right? But then, and maybe there's a phenomena of pleasure. But like self, but I don't even know if there could be a phenomena of pleasure, right? Because that would require, that's a relative thing, right? Joy is a relative thing. So the ones that are kind of tripping me up are joy and self. Yep. <clears throat> yep. I got you, Tanya. It's right where I'm going. Anybody else? Other questions, comments, ideas pop up? Okay, so let me give you the, yeah, I would have to read for a while to get to this. So let me, I'm going to give you the, the, the cliff notes of this really quickly. So
uh, oh, there's so many interesting little things going on in here. So the one, one of the things that's going on, I think the major thing that's going on here is Srimala is, she's really defining Mahayana Buddhism. And what I mean by that is this, these, you know, I hope that you've heard of the language of these four mistaking suffering for pleasure, mistaking the impermanent for permanent. I hope you've heard that language before because what stream, again, I'm going to try to just say this directly. This is my interpretation of what she's talking about. There seems to be a misunderstanding, she's, she's saying, that when the Shravakas and the Pratekya Buddhas, when they got this message, they seem to have heard not about mistaking the impermanent for permanent, they seem to have heard that nothing's permanent. Rather than saying mistaking suffering for pleasure, they seem to have heard that there's no pleasure. Rather than mistaking, right, this self, that, that which has no self for self, they've taken it as that there's no self at all not just mistaking not self for self, but they took it as an absolute that there's no self at all. And then finally, this one about impure, not mistaking impurity for purity, they seem to have mis forgotten or think that there's no purity at all. So there's this, there's this sort of Mahayana understanding, which is that it's this idea that I mean, this, this gets so tricky. It gets so, so tricky. But what she's ultimately saying is, is that the Dharma body of the Buddha is permanent, is joyful, is with self, and is pure in that sense. And what I mean to say is, and this is what I kind of alluded to at the very beginning of my talk when I said that an understanding of the Dharma body of the Buddha, the Dharmakaya, do you want to understand what the Dharmakaya is? If you want to understand what the Dharmakaya is, it has to do with these four wrong views. And what I mean is, is this. So this body, the Rupakaya, as it's called, the body of form, this body is impermanent. This one's decaying, definitely. <laughs> I, I don't know any other body but this one. And this is the one that I often mistake for being permanent. It's why I get so frustrated when things start falling apart, because I'm, I'm hoping. I'm hoping for the, the permanence in that way, right? So when it comes to this kaya, when it comes to this rupa kaya, this body of form, I mistake the impermanent for permanent, right? When it comes to the pleasures of the sensory organs of this body, those tastes and the sounds and the sights and the smells and oh, the feelings of the body, right? Mistaking those sensory pleasures mistaking that for pleasure, that's my problem. That's my suffering problem, is mistaking those for pleasure. Mistaking the five aggregates, mistaking this skanda situation for the self, that's my problem. And then finally, mistaking the impure for pure, and that would be about mistaking this body as being pure when it is a compounded conditional thing in that way. So I've just outlined the four, the four things that suck about the conditional body, right? No, but the, the four aspects of this that pertain to this body 
And so the idea is if you want to understand the Dharmakaya, yeah, it's not that one. It's not the impermanent body. It's the permanent body. It's not the suffering body. It's the joyful body, right? It's not the body that has no self. It is the one that has self. Tanya, that's kind of the answer there. And then the fourth one is, yeah, it's not the impure body. It's the pure body. So again, my point is, is that in the Theravada, they're not thinking this way. <laughs> there, it's all suffering. It's all impermanent. <laughs> it all is no self. And it's all impure in that way. Further questions, comments, answers, ideas? Uh, yeah, I have a question, Michael. Um, yeah. From this teaching, would you say that we need, as human beings, I don't know how to put it in a different way, but we need to know suffering. We, we need to know suffering in order to, you know, we need this. We need this ignorance in order to know what non-ignorance is, question mark. The, uh, yeah, right? Buckle up. Buckle up, everybody. <laughs> okay. So everybody's feeling good, though, except for that, Connie's great question. Comment, actually, that idea. Exa okay. From where I just left off, world honored one, the so called pure knowledge is the perfection of knowledge of all the Shravakas and Prateki Buddhas. Even this pure knowledge, pure as it is said to be, cannot embrace the realm of the noble truth of cessation, or the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, that third noble truth, let alone the knowledge of those who practice the four reliances, this is another idea that she's sprinkling as a breadcrumb trail. And I'm not going to follow this trail right now, but she's dropping a new idea out. A new idea in fours, by the way. She loves ideas in fours. So she's talking about these people who practice the four reliances. Hold on to that. World honored one. These four reliances, which she's going to explain later, are mundane dharmas, regular old mundane dharmas, world honored one. There is one reliance, however, which is the highest of all reliances, which is the super mundane, supreme and ultimate reliance, namely nirvana, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering. Number three, nirodha, nirvana, the cessation of suffering. It's what it's all about. We're moving into chapter 13 because I really want to read a part that addresses Connie's comments so perfectly. World honored one, the cycle of birth and death, i.e. samsara, is based upon the Tathagata Garbha. Because of the Tathagata Garbha, that womb of Buddhas, the beginning of samsara is unknowable. World honored one. If one says that because there is the Tathagata, I'm the Tathagata Garpa, that there is samsara, that person speaks well. The world honored one. The cycle of birth and death means the cessation of the sense faculties and the immediate arising of new sense faculties, moment to moment, world honored one, the two dharmas, birth and death, are the Tathagata Garbha itself. They are called birth and death only from a conventional point of view. World honored one, death means the cessation of sense faculties Birth means the arising of sense faculties. The Tathagata Garbha, however, neither arises 
nor ceases to be, neither emerges nor vanishes. It is beyond the realm of conditioned things that arise and cease. World Honored One, the Tathagata Garbha is permanent and indestructible. Therefore, World Honored One, the Tathagata Garbha is the base, the support, and the foundation of the wisdom of liberation. It is also the base, the support, the foundation of all conditioned dharmas. World Honored One, if there were no Tathagata Garbha, there would be no abhorrence of suffering, and there would no, be no longing for nirvana. How so? The seven dharmas, which includes the six consciousnesses and their objects, are momentary and non-abiding, and therefore cannot retain the experience of suffering. Hence, they are unable to abhor suffering or aspire to nirvana. The Tathagata Garbha has no beginning, neither arises nor ceases, and can retain the experience of suffering. It is the cause of sentient beings' renunciation of suffering and their aspiration for nirvana. Okay. Everybody hear why I wanted to get to that part? It's exactly what Connie was talking about. It's exactly the thesis or it's what Srimal is talking about. It's a, if I were to summarize it in my Cliff Notes version, She's describing the, a basic Mahayana idea, by the way. She's just explaining it very, very well. But it's the basic Mahayana idea that there is a way to view samsara through the understanding of emptiness, which then evacuates samsara of its conditionality in that sense and reveals it as this womb womb of buddhahood so what i'm getting at is is that there's basically this really interesting mahayana way of viewing the conditioned as the very womb out of which buddhas are born and the idea being that if we didn't have this suffering experience, we wouldn't aspire for nirvana. That's the crux of her kind of, um, of her teaching here. So it's a whole new way of looking at this world. And I, I, I want to say this too, I want to kind of remind you of something that I've said in the past. One of the basic ideas of Mahayana Buddhism is that the early tradition meaning the Shravaka path, the Theravada path, the, crit the Mahayana critique is that they are really negative, <laughs> like really negative about this world, that it's like hell. And they just kind of walk around like, oh, it's like hell everywhere. And there's a way from a Mahayana point of view that that's gonna put you right smack dab in hell. <laughs> if you if you see it that way, then that's where you are. This is Vimalakirti time. This is you know, this is the Buddha touching his big toe to the earth and revealing the only hell is in the mind in that way. Right. And so what I'm getting at is that in the early tradition, they started to view samsara as if it were hell. And it was like, come on, everybody, we got to get out of hell. We got to get out of samsara. Come on, come on, come on. And the Mahayana is sort of not looking at things so dualistically, frankly. That's the whole message. They're like, wait, didn't the Buddha say middle path? Let me check the record. Let me check. So that's the idea. That's my Cliff Notes summary of this. Oh, good. We still have time. 
questions, comments, answers, ideas? What a little bit ties into it, Michael, is also when we talk about the different realms of existence, right? Like the God realms and the human realm. So if we look into the um, God realms, or how do you call them, God realms? Uh, and, heavenly, heavenly and realms. Heavenly realms, and everything is pleasure, and you wouldn't experience suffering. Um, you wouldn't get that far. So. Um, exactly, exactly. And, you know, in fact, there's um, certain Buddhist texts that speak about the human experience. And, you know, one of the things I love about Buddhism, it's why I teach it, why I love it, is, you know, this language of sentient, all sentient beings. Buddhism is serious when they talk about all sentient beings. Um, I, I really appreciate this tradition for being, it's sort of, I mean, it's anthropocentric, meaning it's focused on human beings, but I would say that's only because they know that human beings can read. <laughs> and so the message is designed for human beings because it's a message primarily in texts and language in that way. But my point is, is that Buddhism really yeah, Connie, I mean, there's the whole spectrum of what they call the six realms from the hell dweller, hungry ghost, animal, human, asura, or demigod as they're called, and then the gods. That's the trajectory. And what's interesting about the human being in between the heavenly realm and the lower realms, the idea is, is that, well, let me, let me, return to an idea. This is a good kind of idea to kind of start to wrap things up on. So this idea of, well, mistaking maybe uh, suffering for pleasure might be one, uh, but this idea. So one of the things about being a human is that to a certain degree, and we talked about this last week, to a certain degree, we have free will. We are determined, we are conditioned. That's such a deep part of the Buddhist teaching is that we are deeply conditioned beings, but there would be no hope. <laughs> there would be no hope at all if we didn't have a little, you know, what they call Buddha nature in that way, but the possibility of free will. And an example of that is, you know, if you, if you take an, an animal and don't give it any food for a week and you take a human and don't give it any food for a week, after a week, if you put a plate of food in front of a human and a plate of food in front of an animal, I don't imagine any animal that isn't going to dive in immediately. It's the human being though that can actually even as hungry as they are, they could actually not eat. Uh, wait, I, I could, you know, like, let's say you were a good Buddhist and this plate of food showed up at 12.01, right? Right after midday. And you were a good Buddhist and you don't want to eat after midday. You would say, well, I'll put that aside until tomorrow morning. You could, we could do that. Human beings have very much the ability, despite a week of hunger, we could still exercise free will in that sense. An animal, not so much. An animal is a little more conditioned that way, not so much. And, you know, some animals may share food with others, but some are a little more um, oblivious that way to others. Humans, though, again, a mother who's starving would quickly give their food to their child who is you know also hungry so the human has this ability to not give in to every sensual stimuli in that way and that's again part of our our uniqueness is that we are not fully conditioned like animals but in reference to connie's comment what's interesting is, is that when you move this direction into the realm of the heavenly beings the thing about being a heavenly being is you can manifest food whenever you're hungry. Boom. There, there's no situation where you would ever have to not 
eat. There's no peer week where you wouldn't have it because you can just make it appear whenever you want. And so what they say in a lot of Buddhist texts is that the gods, they suffer, but they suffer differently. And the idea is, is that because they can satisfy every pleasure immediately be through, through mind, they don't experience loss the way humans do. They don't experience suffering in a, such an acute way as humans. And so they have no real impetus to get out of that situation. And, you know, I always like to pull this out of the realm of mythology. Not that I, you know, heavenly realms, hell realms, uh, you know, who knows, but there's also a way of looking at the heavenly realm as a realm of having a tremendous amount of money and, and um, access so that you don't really have to experience suffering in, you can always avoid it in some way because you could just kind of order up room service, so to speak. <laughs> Um, and so the idea is, is that there's a lot of relationship between heavenly realms and the, the problems of living in a heavenly realm and just the problems of being very uh, wealthy in that way, where you can circumvent a lot of life suffering and then never get that kick in the butt to try to actually propel you out of suffering in the Buddhist way. So just wanted to make that comment about uh, re in, in kind of riffing off of Connie's comment about the heavenly realms in that way. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about any of that? All right. Well, let's see. I mean, we still have a few minutes. And I did want to get a little further along. So can everybody do another paragraph? Awesome. So, and actually, I don't even know if we'll get into another paragraph because this sentence, it's a juicy sentence right here. Um, okay. So she's still talking about the Tathagata Garbha. Again, interesting way of looking at samsara in that sense. And she says, just in case you missed it, she says, uh, you know what? I'm not going to read this. I'm not going to read this. It's juicy, but it's too big. It's like a whole Dharma talk. I'm already starting to develop this giant Dharma talk in my head. So let me go back actually to something so that I can finish this idea, the Dharmakaya idea, because it's going to be a new board next week. So something came up. It was right before Connie's question that got me reading ahead. So let me go back. So he says this thing about, it was after she introduced the interesting paramita of the self and the paramita of the permanent. And she says, so those sentient beings who assume such a view, and by the way, the view is, is that the Dharmakaya of the Buddha, the Dharmakaya of the Tathagata is permanent, joyful with a self and pure. The, those sentient beings who assume such a view are said to have the right view. Those who, assu who assume the right view are called the true children of the Buddha, born from the Buddha's mouth, born from the true Dharma, born from the Dharma miraculously. And they are heirs to the Buddha Dharma. I wanted to focus on that. So I mentioned it briefly last time, this, these two ideas, the Tathagata Garbha, the, the womb, the womb of thus come ones, the womb of Tathagatas, the, the womb of Buddhas. So there's that idea. And there's this idea, the Dharmakaya. And, and they are 
they are part and parcel of the same idea. She's always talking about them in the same breath. And I mentioned it last week that the word garbha, tathagata garbha, I mentioned that the word garbha has a lot of different meanings, or actually it has a lot of similar meanings. They're not actually that different. They're very similar. But the range, the range of meanings goes from the anatomical womb, like a, the womb of a mother that gestates a child, the womb. And then at this end is a treasury, a repository, a storehouse. So there's, those are related, of course. You can look at a womb as a very special treasury, right? A very, very special repository. Likewise, you can look at treasuries and repositories as interesting wombs in that sense. Now, I, what I mentioned last week was that um, a few commentators would dissuade you from thinking of this as the womb of Tathagatas, that even though the word garbha can have the anatomical meaning, a lot of commentators push towards the more like a vault, like a, a vault or a treasury. And I said last week, I was like, I would not avoid the anatomical meaning of garbha. I would not avoid the womb meaning. And the reason why that is, is because we are talking about the Dharma body of the Buddha and where that comes from. I know where this Rupakaya came from, so to speak. It, all, it came from a womb, came from my mother's womb in that sense. So the Rupakaya comes from a womb. And so the idea of a Dharmakaya, the Dharma body of the Buddha or a Buddha, also comes from a womb, but a very, very kind of mystical, wild, wonderful womb in that way. And the thing about it is, is that if you don't, if you don't entertain the womb metaphor, then you miss this, be the beautiful significance of the language of becoming a true child of the Buddha, right? Born of the Buddha's mouth, born of the Dharma. So that idea, they are talking explicitly about being born, in it, almost being reborn in a way, in your Dharmakaya, as a true child of the Buddha. And again, I think, I think there's a very motherly, I said that too, kind of several nights ago, that there's like a major feminine motherly vibe to this whole sutra it's queen Srimala, right but you miss a lot if you don't uh, get that this is the 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 womb the tathagata garbha because there's so much uh birthing metaphor going on so that's it questions comments answers ideas excellent Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Um, that's it for Dharma.